Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome. Um, I'm Cherie Renee Thomas, and I'm here to moderate um, our next panel discussion, which is where there is a woman, there is magic. Um, very excited to introduce four creator creators um, here from around the world. Um, where there is a woman, there is a magic comes from Intazaki Shange's powerful quote, which speaks to the resourcefulness and the innovation of women. And like so many other communities, black women were impacted by the pandemic in ways that were of course adverse, but in other ways that forced us to reach and grow and to be even more resourceful than ever. Today, we're gonna to talk about some of the challenges that we have seen and witnessed, and also how the different ways and resources we have marshaled together to survive and thrive, if possible, during this um, period. Um, it's interesting coming from uh, Rashida's presentation on uh, Black women and time. Um, as uh, one of my uh, panelists said, that we are beyond time in a lot of ways. Um, we're going to talk about how we build a transformative future um, together. So the first person I would like to introduce to you is Natasha A. Kelly. Natasha A. Kelly has a PhD in communication studies and sociology. She is the author and editor of six books, a curator and an artist. Her art installations were shown at the German Historical Museum Berlin, at the German Hygiene Museum in Dresden, and at the Kunst Palace Dusseldorf, among others. She made her film debut at the 10th Berlin Biennale, or Biennale, Biennale excuse me, in 2018, with her award-winning and internationally traveled documentary, Millie's Awakening. Um, film and installations and screenings have followed in other prestigious museums, including the Martin Kunst in Frankfurt and many more. Um, she is known for her publications and also as being a person who brings disparate groups together. Um, I'll bring two of her publications um, to your attention. Um, you must look for her newest book, uh, Racism, Structural Problems Need Structural Solutions, which came out in April of this year. And it was a direct response to the Black Lives Matter summer of 2020. Also, The Comet, Afrofuturism 2.0, which came out last year. And it was a part of a symposium that Natasha curated of the same name, which she curated at the Howe Theater in 2018. Um, celebrating W.E.B. Du Bois and his contributions to our thoughts on Afrofuturism. So that's Natasha A. Kelly. Hi, to say a few words. Yeah, it's really nice to be um, a part of this symposium. Greetings from Berlin. It's late over here. I know you're still in your afternoon coffee and kuchen modus, as we would say here, um, coffee and cake. But um, yeah, and I, I didn't want to miss this for anything um, to, like I always um, tell Ronaldo Anderson, you're not going to the future without us Afro-Germans. <laughs> We're trying to catch up so much to time. I really enjoyed the previous presentation because I do deal a lot with time and space, like maybe we all do. But that was really, really interesting. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. It's going to be lovely talking with you today or tonight. <laughs> My next panelist is D.L. Littlefield. D.L. Littlefield is an Afro-Mississippi writer, editor, and a professor. <laughs> you here, dear? All right. She's a regular contributor to creative and literary projects in the Mississippi region. She works to document and preserve Black vernacular and culture from the American South. A two-time Kalalu Fellow, she holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. She has served as editor and creative director for BG Memphis Magazine and as assistant editor for Hieroglyph. In 2021, she co-curated with me and Desha Polk the Afrofuturist virtual exhibition Curating the End of the World Red Spring, which you can see right now live during the Altered Worlds Festival and anytime um, in the future on the Google Arts and Culture platform. This is the third installment of the series by the Black Speculative Arts Movement, BSAM, hosted by Bill T. Jones's New York Live Arts and the Google Cultural Institute. 
E.L. Littlefield, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm I'm so excited to be here. I'm so happy to see everyone. Uh, I am a professor at Russ College, actually in Mississippi. I'm here in Memphis. Uh, so I often refer to this area as Mississippi. You know, in Memphis, we're right on the state line and it's very hard to distinguish what state we really, we really live in. Um, I want to say also, I was just so pleased to listen to the presentation right before about time because in the South, I think we're often kind of seen as and feel like we are behind, right? We're kind of stuck in the past and kind of always trying to catch up to, to the present day and to the future. So thanks for, for having me. Thank you. All right. So my next wonderful guest for you all um, is a multi-talented person as well. Florence Okoye is a user experience designer, coder, and founder of Afro Futures UK, an interdisciplinary collective dedicated to exploring how technology both shapes and reimagines the Black experience. Inspired by Afro Futures writers and thinkers such as Octavia E. Butler, Coldwell Rui Shun, and Reynaldo Anderson, Afro Futures UK is especially interested in using creative technology to reveal untold histories of the Black community, which can be a source of inspiration for developing a more intersectional future. Afro Futures UK has hosted workshops in comic creation and coding, um, engaged academics through open conferences and citizen science jams, and has also explored radical artistic practices to, to share and evolve new narratives. Florence Okoye, hello. Hi. Oh, Hi. I'm excited to be here. Um, <laughs> might be able to tell from the accent, I'm joining you from Warwick in the UK. Okay. Um, yeah, just really excited. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I had a great pleasure of uh, meeting Florence and her wonderful Afrofutures team in um, um, Birmingham, right? <laughs> For my first time in Birmingham, um, UK. Fabulous, fabulous city. Thank you so much. And uh, my last wonderful panelist that I'm going to introduce to you all um, is right here in New York City, where I happen to be for the time being. <laughs> Nyama Safaya Sandy is a New York based cultural anthropologist, a curator, a producer and a multidisciplinary artist. Nayama's creative practice delves into the human story through the application and critical lenses of culture, healing, history, migration, music, race, and ritual. She sees her role as that of an agitator, one who endeavors to simultaneously call into question and to make sense of the seemingly arbitrary nature of modern life and to celebrate our shared humanity and the process. Sandy is fascinated by the ways in which history, economics, migration, and other social forces and constructs have shaped us all, our culture and our identity. Um, I'd just like to also mention that Sandy is a co-founder of the Blacksmiths, which is a coalition that's forging support for black liberation against anti-black racism um, in all of its manifestations in the academy in particular and in cultural institutions on the global stage. Um, she is also a member of the Resistance Revival Chorus, which is a group of women and non-binary identifying musicians bringing song to life and the spirit of activism. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, Diana, please speak. Give us a few words of greeting. Hi. Good yeah. afternoon and good night, Natasha. Such a such a pleasure to be with you all today. I'm actually not in New York right now. Oh, I'm in <laughs> Pittsburgh. Oh, nice. Um, I just had an incredible conversation with a group of beautiful Black women artists here. So I'm so happy and also echoing um, what Dr. Littlefield said about that previous presentation. So critically important and really just a beautiful segue into our conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, the reason why I wanted to have this conversation is because black women have been um, impacted by uh, this pandemic in ways that really kind of um, revealed things that we've known for a long time, the inequities in our societies. Um, and it's something that's brought into attention on a national and an international level. I think each of you are uniquely suited to speak on um, your witnessing at this time, this important critical time where our societies um, around the world are facing very tough questions about how they want to go in the future and the kinds of 
communities that they want to create. Um, one thing that I'm very conscious of, uh, there's an old saying we have um, in the South that um, you want a church, you need 12 women. Right? <laughs> you can have a preacher and some deacons and what have you, but the actual church making and community making and building, that is going to come usually from women, intergenerational women. And so here I am here with four wonderful creators. And I would just like to start off with D.L. Littlefield, if that's OK. And then we're going to move around the world. Right. Right. Are you ready? <laughs> She's like, I don't know, Sheree. <laughs> All righty. Now, um, one thing that I know um, about uh, Little Phil is that um, she navigates uh, spaces very gracefully. Um, she talked about being not only from Memphis, Tennessee, but having roots also in Mississippi and having this, um, this identity, this hybrid identity of those two places because the borders are very, very fluid in that regard, not only because of the bloodlines and the history that we share, but also the geography of it. Um, I would like for you to discuss your speculative vision of Black women um, rooted in natural practices, um, crossing borders of the living and uh, the spirit realm, Black women as divination. So I, I wanted to speak a little bit today about Black women, particularly Black women working in speculative fiction and speculative arts in general as diviners, right? And how these acts of writing, these novels, whether they're short stories, poems, creating works of art are really acts of divination, right? As Black women, not only in present day, but really throughout history, we kind of have to be responsible for everyone. We have to anticipate not only what we're going to need, but what everyone around us is going to need. This was really no more evident for me than it was during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, right? Because everyone is was in crisis, right? And Black women were in crisis, but we also had to take care of everyone else who was in crisis. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think of a lot of, for instance, thinking about Octavia Butler's novels, not only her novels, but her short stories, which are really my personal favorite, um, which she has said, uh, I always kind of famously remember her saying that they're not prophecy. They were just cautionary tales. But to all of us, they are absolutely prophetic. I think, I think about divination and the fact that we think of divination often as predicting the future or foretelling the future. But divination really deals with being able to read signs, to interpret signs, to understand the significance of events uh, and other things around us so that it can help us foretell what is to come, right? So that we can kind of stay ready so we don't have to get ready, right? A kind of phrase Black people love, right? Because we have to really be ready for everyone. We have to be ready for everyone. Um, so... I think of a lot of this work in Afrofuturism, not only as reading the signs and interpreting the signs, not only as foretelling the future, but also preparing ourselves and everyone around us for different options, futures that we know are to come. There was a moment earlier this evening in the symposium where they talked for quite a while about uh, the hyper surveillance, right? That we're living in this state of hyper surveillance now, which is only growing kind of more and more intimidating. Mm -hmm. Into that, there's a, a, a sort of a threat from all of kind of the visual technology, right? Where now we're kind of entering this state where not only do we know we're being watched, really at all times, we're being watched, we're being listened to. But also, we also can't trust what we see and what we hear. There is technology that can uh, put you in a place where you've never been. They can put your face on someone else's body. There are bots on social media who pretend to be Black women in particular. It's not many other people that they're pretending to be besides Black women. Right. So we also kind of can't trust the news. We can't trust information. We can't trust what we see or hear. When I think about the push or I guess the kind of growing trend of Black women, particularly in America, moving toward mysticism, moving toward African traditional spiritual systems. I think part of this move is a sort of anticipation 
that there will come a future where what we're in right now, where we can't trust what we see and hear. We can't trust technology. We can't trust the news. The only thing we can trust is our power of divination, right? The only thing we can trust is our relationship with the spiritual world. The only thing we can trust is our relationship with the spiritual world. Very, very interesting. Um, the thing that has um, struck me about this telling of signs, watching the signs, um, that is that is very much the work of a speculative fiction writer or creator. You are observing your society in the present tense. You are using the, the lessons and the hidden history of the past. You're excavating that to try to inform what you are doing um, in terms of extrapolating what the possible futures might be. If we keep doing this, then we may find ourselves here in the future. The thing about Octavia Butler's work is that while she would label those works more as uh, particularly kindred as fantasy and her other work is science fiction, not particularly prophetic. She seems very, you know, kind of concerned about, you know, having that that weight placed upon her shoulders. She was actually observing the world as it was around her in the present tense in the 80s, right? And because we haven't as a society here and as a world, as a global economy, haven't changed those large moving systems that operate whether individuals choose to be a part of them actively or not, right? Then you're going to see some similarities. You're gonna see the same things happening generations later because we haven't changed the root things of that. Um, I wanted to move to uh, Nayama, Nayama to talk about some of the work that you're doing, um, some of the radical revisioning of, of you know, our, I guess the way that we see our place in the world and the way that we use our art. Because um, that's the other thing I really enjoyed from the presentations that came um, earlier, this idea that we can take this technology, we can take these tools and reimagine them for our own use rather than um, being the ones who are being, you know, being uh, acted upon. We are the ones who have the agency. Could you talk a little bit more about how you, have um, incorporated your own vision into your work and why you're choosing to do that in that way? Well, um, again, thank you for this great question. And really sort of echoing something that um, Elle said there. So, so much of what we understand to, to be life, right? Is like through these lenses of how it's all through us understanding and, and making meaning from the tools that our ancestors have left for us. So this this idea of the word technology, right? Like it isn't just our computers, it's our braids. It's, you know, it's all of these, these tools that we use in life. And so thinking about singing, thinking about the fact that like, it's really new for us to be able to use music and recorded music in a particular way, right? And just really activating those histories and um, our connection to ourselves and our ancestors through that. Um, so in particular, the most recent works, um, so as we said, uh, the Blacksmiths just developed last June um, and we have worked in coalition with many other groups that sort of ad hoc came together through the pandemic, um, including the Wide Awakes. And so a lot of what we were doing was really just activating joy and thinking about joy as a portal to possibility um, and really thinking about how do we put people's power back into their own hands? How do we activate people toward recognizing their own ability to change a future? Even if it's not just their own, thinking about themselves as a cog in a community, in a much larger one than where you live, but also the state, the city, where you live it, on the planet. Like how do we shift all of that together? And I think, you know, it's been an interesting and really beautiful uh, moment in terms of having people think about that and connect to that. Yeah, I wanna get back to you on that um, because you are able to do, you're doing this in so many different spaces. And I imagine the the, the diplomacy that you must um, leverage and the politics <laughs> of your space is part of that that work as well, as particularly as a black woman artist, right? Um, entering these spaces and and, and using, using these resources in different ways than they perhaps are, are traditionally used. So, and Certainly. each of you actually have done that. <laughs> 
<laughs> in your own journey. So we'll, we'll um, so I would like to talk more about that. Um, Natasha, Dr. Kelly, um, you, uh, you're very humble. That's what I just want to say for our audience who may not know, uh, you are a, you are a lightning rod in Germany. I might say um, a source of inspiration for a lot of people. Um, just you uh, pioneering on your own in, a, in, a, in many ways uh, um, and asking the questions that need to be asked and creating the space for others to come out of their, their, their communities and to come and talk as a group about what is happening for Afro-Germans, the Afro-Dutch, um, has created um, quite a community um, wherever you go. Could you talk about what it was that, um, because it's actually, when I think about you, I realize pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, Natasha was doing the same, you know, change-making work, right? <laughs> Right. And that's the, and, that, and that's really true for all of us. I feel like we were even though the pandemic exposed the fact that of what we already know, black women are underpaid. They are underutilized. Their resources are underestimated. Often um, they are often training other people and answering all the questions and doing other work. And yet their titles and income does not always reflect that work that people absolutely believe they are entitled to um, and that they um, actually depend upon. To, to execute their vision in the world. We are the, often the invisible ones, right? Behind that labor. Um, it also um, exposed the, the mental health crisis that has been in our communities in the world um, for um, you know, pre-pandemic particularly. Children are, you know, young people have been away from school for a very long time. It is the mothers often who are there sitting there um, on the multiple computers monitoring the schooling that's taking place while also trying to work and being probably the first one to get let go um, from those um, those other jobs. Can you talk about the kind of work that you have been doing in Germany um, before the pandemic and how that may have changed or not um, during the uh, quarantine and afterwards? Because it seems like we've opened up, this pandemic has opened up a space, right? for a lot of conversations that we were being gaslit about. Um. Yeah, I think um, the most important key word is space. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at black German history, it actually started in the women's movement. Wow. So you cannot disconnect um, our community from black feminism. Our movement is rooted in black feminism. So it was from the beginning that this, ho that, um, this whole idea um, was practically put forward or ignited um, through an intersectional idea. And I think that this whole intersectional, I, intersectionality has been something that has carried us for now nearly 40 years. But for the first time through Corona, it has now actually become a thing. Yeah. So um, not for us, obviously, because this is part of, of us, of our system, like the glasses that I wear. But for the majority society, Corona has made things visible, what people were not paying attention to for so long. And... Um, I think alongside um, time and space, um, speed, as Ronaldo Anderson would say, hope he's listening, shout out at this point, has been something that has come into my life since Corona. Because it's not like I'm, um, I'm doing anything different, but I'm, everything has just been hurried up. It's been rushed up. I, it's like where I had one job before Corona, I have 10 now. Mm -hmm. and, um, here in Germany, we're so backward on the topic of, of race and race relations and intersectionality and everything that goes with it that since um, Black Lives Matter are on the streets, and it's not like they, they were on the street for the first time last year here in Germany, could, people could think that, but no, they weren't. We were on, we've been on the streets here for years as well, but people haven't been actually seeing us. No? So, so this becoming visible um, is also important. But speed has become a major factor in my life where everything has just been speeding up. People want to learn 400 years history in four seconds. They want to get, they're like catching up. They need every, you know, it's like 
um, people are really absorbing um, everything that we've been trying to throw at them for years. It's like for the first time they're, they're really sitting down but not really taking the time. Now, we, now we're back to time coming from that lens to actually listen and learn. No, they just want everything, you know, in one gulp and, and best that we chew it for them. And they just have to you know that kind of thing where you're like, no, we're not going to catch up 400 years just in four days, just because you people have now found out what you've been doing wrong all this time. No, this is really about you all sitting back and allowing us to have the space and not only space for our bodies, which is something very seldom here in Germany, but also space for our minds, yeah? Because, I mean, we're here in, in Germany, we're in the mind of the beast, where, where you in the UK might be in the belly of the beast, but we're surely in the mind of the beast. <laughs> where, where this whole thing started, yeah? And so we don't even really have the cognitive space. And I think it was Stacey Robinson that said that earlier, that it, it's also about um, freeing um, freeing the mind, not not also having the mind space to even imagine things. That, that is like one of our most important assets of Afrofuturism in, in, um, to begin with. And this is something where, which I think is now slowly only opening, yeah, that people are for the first time seeing structures, especially from our community, are understanding now what it actually means to look beyond structures, um, to, to actually think beyond structures. So we're like in these, in these massive baby steps. No? We, we, the baby is just about to start to crawl, let's put it that way, into, into the direction of really um, envisioning, envisioning things, coming together as a community. We are otherwise very, so very isolated. Well, I, I got so fed up before Corona, um, you know, just, just being stuck in the past, especially Germany's past. I don't think we have to tell anybody about that part of history. But it's like um, there was nothing beyond that. They, they, they're denying their colonial history. So we as a black people don't even have a presence here. Yeah, although we do. No, so um, I think that these are nothing has really changed apart from that it's been speeding up for me. It's been, I'm trying to gain as much space for this community as possible. I mean, at the moment, I'm discussing having my own theater over here. That's the discussions I'm having because I'm, I'm like, you're 400 years late. This is what we need resources, facilities. We want you who got racism in your theater over there. Look, that's why we need our own theater. We need our own institutions. So this is me, the list getting longer and longer and longer, <laughs> just seriously negotiating with politicians what we need and when we want it. And that is exactly now. So it's just like not waiting for another portal to open in another hundred years. We're all going through it now, taking all our suitcases and everything with us, the house, the donkey, the everything through that portal with us before it closes kind of thing. That's that's how I feel right now. That's that's what's happening here anyway. Okay. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Little Phil has been talking to us about black women um, seeing the signs a lot earlier sometimes than others in our community, sounding the signals, right? And um, trying to be abreast of the changes. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Sandy has been talking to us about the power of collaboration and in reaching into your own roots um, in order to reimagine spaces and, and create other um, and create create change for yourself and create healing spaces for yourself uh, through your art. Uh, Dr. Kelly has been talking about um, the, the double labor that we have to do as black women, which is often you ex uh, or um, black people in general, you experience the oppression. You, um, you experience the lack that comes with it. And then um, when you're seeking to get out of it, you also have to do the extra education of work, the educational work of teaching the oppressors all the ways that they are <laughs> oppressing you so they can stop. Um, I say as if they don't know. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother conversation about the uh, performance part of ignorance. Um, because they know very well when you're resisting it, <laughs> when they're trying to stop it. So obviously there is an awareness there of what's happening. Um, but also talking about, the, okay, so how do we get to parity, right? How do we get to um, 
the space where um, in this accelerated period, right? Where everybody wants black content, black bodies, black brilliance, black creativity right now. <laughs> um, um, and so they can so they can appear often, so they can appear to be um, on the right side of allyship. Um, the execution is sometimes problematic. Um, now we have uh, Florence Okoye uh, from in Warwick, right? Who is working with um, some really fascinating people um, and working from uh, the technical side of things. Could you talk a little bit about how you use your professional work in your communal activism um, work, um, and and where it um, where it blends and where you kind of you know how it separates at times? Yeah. Um, thank you, Shuri. Um, yeah, I mean, there's kind of two sort of two main areas, I guess. There's the um, the, the tech tech. So um, my day job, I work as a user experience designer um, and a researcher, user researcher. So a lot of my work is about, um, you know, trying to understand how and why people interact with technology the way they do um, and how ultimately how whatever gets made by um, technologists from the coder to the designer can impact both individuals and communities. Uh, and so in, in that sense, um, one of the things that, her, that I, I try to do is really try to almost bridge the different worlds that I, I'm kind of part of. So there's like the social world, the world that is like, you know, other black people, other women, other queer people, um, and trying to at least kind of raise awareness about the kind of the technology, the infrastructure that's surrounding us and, and you know, the opportunities for resistance. Um, and, and I think, and that's really where I like to sort of like, I try to focus a bit more of my efforts these days. I think, um, you know, if you were speaking to me maybe two, three years ago, I was kind of very into this whole notion of kind of bringing the community into like the tech spaces because, you know, we need to kind of diversify tech. We need to kind of make it, but actually, you know, as, as kind of, I suppose my practice has matured and as, and seeing kind of more of the trends, um, the, the signs as it were, um, to, to, as Dr. Litterfield was saying, actually it was like, well, to be honest, this, by by in a sense really all that one is enabling is kind of a more inclusive exploitation quite frankly mm. actually what's really needed um are is are, is really to kind of encourage other technologists to kind of go the other way stop trying to bring kind of the other in but actually you yourselves need to actually start almost like turning traitor in a sense like it's actually down to you to say hey this is what this is what's going on and then and sharing that knowledge with the communities that it's impacting. Um, and so some of my work has been really trying to figure out like um, kind of effective ways or sort of sharing, um, you know, what is going on, um, sharing some of the even design methodologies that can be, you know, quite powerful for helping people mm -hmm. um, think about, you know, ways of kind of resisting, ways of creating new ways of like interacting with each other. Um, so a lot of that through workshops um, and, and through talks as well, um, and increasingly through organizing within within the tech sector as well to as much give technologists like the language of as, almost like the language of humility, really, to understand how how it is that they need to um, essentially repair the damage that we're kind of we're doing, the damage that we're working on. Um, and then there's the other aspect. So I currently work at a museum. Um, and I, I am very much um, a museum nerd. I always have been. Um, I, museums, libraries, art galleries, as a kid, those were kind of like my spaces, as it were. Um, and so in many ways, I find, I do, you know, I feel genuinely privileged to be able to work at a national museum, um, <clears throat> which has collections. So it's not the British Museum, it's the Natural History Museum. Um, and it has sort of scientific collections kind of going back to 200, 200 years um, in some cases. Um, and so, you know, because I've always been interested in science and science communication, you know, that's a really interesting opportunity to start thinking about how we can make science more accessible. So, for example, one of the things that um, we did a couple of years ago um, was like running things like we called it the Afro Dino Hack because we were like, well, everyone loves dinosaurs. 
Um, but how many people know about like the dinosaurs of Africa? Like we all know about the T-Rex, we all know about Stegosaurus, we all know kind of about the dinosaurs of like that were discovered quite frankly by colonialists in the Americas. But like how many people know that this is part of like the African heritage as well? The fact that actually there are, there's like a wealth um, of really amazing um, paleontological finds that quite frankly are kind of are, are being taken um, you know, they're the things that are kind of gracing the museums of like Britain, of Germany, of France, of America, of North America. But like, what what do we know about them? Like, and so that so that's that is also part of. You're muted. Sorry. Um, where did I? Where did you? Where did I stop? <laughs> At the findings of Africa. <laughs> Those were the oh, cool. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not so bad then. Um, so I was getting too energized, as you can probably tell, and then my finger. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so that's kind of the other half of the stuff I'm, I, I'm working on a lot more now, like really trying to um, kind of open up these collections that are rightfully ours, and the knowledge that actually, mm. in fact, not only... <laughs> You know, the, the travesty actually is not just, it's not solely the knowledge that was taken um, out of our communities, but then was kind of um, replaced by, you know, very simplistic, like fundamentalist, like religion. Um, and actually now, if, you know, my I'm of Nigerian origin, you know, it's, it's kind of a tragedy to think that there are specimens from Nigeria and the Niger area of Africa that are being studied by scientists in Britain, in Germany, whereas kind of back home, as we might say, like what do what does the average child know about the Nigerosaurus? You know, and in fact, actually, we're kind of, we're seeing the rise of like this fundamentalist Christianity um, and Wahhabist Islam, which often actually encourages quite like, you know, actually, a, quite frankly, a lot of self-hate. So that's kind of the sort of thing that I'm in in my small way trying to kind of do, I suppose, and try to heal. In a way. Mm -hmm. So you are making, you have made a movement during this time period. I think I saw you in 2018, the last yeah. time I saw you in person, right? And, mm -hmm. and so now it's like you're moving, like you're kind of started off as a cognitive scientist in a way, you know, asking the questions of, you know, how, you know, how we all respond to our apps and our computers and all this other stuff. But now you're moving out of that, maybe moving out of that into a more experiential thing where you're saying, oh, let us, let us center ourselves in our, you know, African, you know, knowledge in the, in the, in the, in the world that it's already present. Mm -hmm. Let us center ourselves there and then move and move outward from there. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting um, philosophical shift you have to make, right? When you're doing it. It's, and I find that it's, in this time of the pandemic, when there is a lot of overt, um, lively, spirited discussion right, about what we're going to be doing with what resources, when and where and how and who should marshal them and what is the nature of a city and who's what's the responsibility of a city to, of a city to its people? What's the responsibility of government, you know, to its citizens? Um, having that kind of philosophical shift. Um, it's also a liberating thing, but also one that's going to create a lot of backlash. Uh, we're already seeing it um, in where I'm, where I live normally in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm in the land of the Lenape now, but uh, Memphis, Tennessee, the land of the Cherokee and the Chickasaw Indians originally, um, land that was very fertile, worked by my family's ancestors and others for generations to help build the first wealth for the United States. I always like to acknowledge um, that labor as well as the land uh, because they go hand in hand. But I'm thinking about how these conversations are um, very exciting for us, right? I was telling one of my younger uh, uh, children that, you know, I spent the early part of my adult life being gaslit about whether or not racism existed at all, right? That was a thing. Um, we won't even talk about the Me Too movement, <laughs> which was a whole nother level of, you know, cognitive dissonance now. Um, the things that we we lived under, right? The societal, under, you know, understandings that we had as a culture, right? Um, there is going to be a lot of space open for change. 
But we're going to have to, as always, as black women who read the signs and the symbols and keep aware of the history and pay attention to what's happening, we're going to have to protect ourselves well for that backlash, right? Already a Tennessee legislation has, legislature has decided um, to um, expedite a move that they have done a few years ago. First, they had a whole open vote about whether or not we should have African-American history as a part of the curriculum in the state. They wanted people to vote on that. Um, and now they've already made a move to basically um, try to teach children that slavery was a good, <laughs> was a good you know, to take us back to, you know, 1800s foolishness um, in Tennessee. And that's just in my little small neck of the woods. Um, so there is an active backlash. We all have got a chance to um, to talk with every um, to, to get to know each of you now. So um, if we could have an open conversation. Um, amongst ourselves, and then we'll um, open it up <laughs> to the public um, and reminding everyone that you are welcome to visit the inner space um, virtual community at any time um, to explore um, this wonderful symposium and to see the Red Spring exhibition and see part of curating the end of the world exhibition. All of those wonderful things are in the inner space um, area. Um, but um, one thing I know Diana said that you wanted to talk about was restitution. Yeah. Um, and I think technically, I, I actually have thought about this twice, listening to both you, Florence, and you, Natasha. Um, I'm thinking in particular, Natasha, about something in your backyard, the Humboldt Museum. Mm -hmm. Messy. Um, <laughs> and just, you know, like, so there was... Um, an interview I was able to do, like, it's about three years ago. There were two. There was one specifically about um, the VNA not returning these Ethiopian artifacts. I don't know if anybody remembers. Um, in 2018, it was the 150th anniversary of uh, the Makdala expedition. Um, and so there was this whole moment where like Ethiopia had been asking and asking and asking for them to return these things. And uh, the <laughs> director of the VNA told them that they could borrow them. They could loan them to them. What? What are we talking about here? And it's just, I, I suppose the, the situation is, as you just said, um, Cherie, you know, the second that you have to reckon with that, everybody else is going to begin to, to like clamor and like, basically ask for what is theirs and they should. And so I wonder about where you all think we're going to find ourselves as it relates, not just to restitution with, you know, these artifacts that uh, Florence has been talking about, but also just restitution, reparation, just like all of it. What do you, what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> uh, I guess the first thing I was thinking about when you were talking was this idea, you know, there's a group of black women here and we're talking about like the varied experiences we've had under this pandemic, right? Um, we're all artists um, and also um, educators and, and creators. Um, just on the, on the basic level in terms of family across the realm, we are, you know, in deep survival mode. Like, um, you know, women have been caregivers, um, not only for their children, but also for elders in their family. I know so many people who um, have had to either if their if their loved one wasn't living with them, they've had to consolidate uh, resources, um, coordinate or delegate with the other siblings how that's going to be done so they can take care of, of others. All of this off of of not the best money, you know, that they should have. And I'm thinking about um, Zora Neale Hurston and the statement about black women being the mules of the world. And I'm also thinking about how if you address women's needs, if you address women's needs as in a society, all of the society is lifted. All of it is raised. The level of, of, of health, um, the level of stability, of, of, of you know, efficiency, all of it moves up. And it seems like we resist this. We know this intellectually, but there's a resistance on a, on a societal level to wh where power is, you know, where the power is. Um, to actually make the shifts, because all you have to do is ask here. They'll have all the details of what they need, right? 
often on different avenues, different strategies on how do you can accomplish or achieve that thing because they are the ones that are having to kind of, uh, you know, you know, quilt together things to, to solve the problem. And yet there's a resistance for that. And so when I think about conversations about restitution and that, I'm always faced, I'm always faced with this idea, well, they already know what they should do. They're actively choosing not to century after century after century. So what is it that we're going to do? It's not even a question of what restitution and what types of repair or what types of corrections need to be, course changes need to be made in our society. But it is, what is it going to take to make those things happen? That's the thing. What is it going to take to make those things happen? Um, because we already know what the result is going to be. But there is this, this, this psychic um, resistance to that. And it's not just misogynoir. It's not just patriarchy. It's something else, right? And I, I quite don't have my finger on that. But yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this takes me actually to my recent book talking about racism as a structural issue. Because yeah. I think the question of restitution is bigger to bigger than who we need to send them back. Because the question is who are we sending them back to? Certainly. Certainly. Yeah? There um, I mean the, the spaces um I mean museums in themselves are Eurocentric constructs right so if we send things back to africa where where do they go can we actually trace them back to their owners because i believe like if you take any mask for example that they definitely weren't supposed to be hanging on a wall in some absolutely not <laughs> so i think that the that we have to look at these these questions more bigger than that and um it's funny that you mentioned the humbug because I, I just got back from around the corner and they've just literally finished building it and it's it's like a palace in the middle of berlin right so you're you we're in the 21st century and you're asking yourself who needs a palace you know i mean it's it's ridiculous it's it's bombastic this huge stupid thing with stolen goods in it that's that's and i was there with some of my activist friends and we were like no it's just so violent even just looking at it from the outside i i, I don't even want to enter let's put it that way but i think that um we the dialogue has definitely started here in germany i can say that for sure and it's been going on longer than last summer um on on restitution on um um where to get them where to bring them back to um but i think that the biggest problem that's now become visible is who is actually having a conversation with who on this topic yeah because um they they always talk about having dialogue yeah on eye level but um there is no such thing as an eye level between a central european and an african no matter where from mm -hmm. there is because there's always the power structure in that always and there always will be so this is where the whole conversation is lean from the beginning yeah of even having a dialogue on eye level where there's no such thing as eye level. So it's, um, there's a lot of layers, um, a lot of, lot of, lot of layers to this story, um, which actually takes me back to something that you said, um, Florence, talking about the, um, the digital um, and that, um, how you, you spent the past two years, because I saw you both in 2018 here in Berlin as well, um, Cherie and, and Florence for the last time. And, that's what struck me to, um, was to say that because um, we've all all gone viral, we've, we've all been going digital during Corona. But what shocked me was to hear that the digital space is also not a safe space for us, that these um, parameters and um, are just um, what did you say? An inclusive exploitation yeah. that really stayed with me because I, I always saw um, saw it as um, you know, a space to get out of these structures, but um, but it isn't. So that that that's racist kind of algorithms, as Nayama just said, is racist algorithms, right? The Absolutely. input, the data that the computer gets comes from a human, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is actually how, what ties these two stories together, because it, we're talking about the same structures, and it doesn't matter if these structures are a line of algorithms, squares and dots, and I don't even know how you write those things. But, mm -hmm. uh, or if it's a brick wall, 
Yeah, it's the same structures that are are, are taking control or constructing this planet in every single way that we, that we kind kind of like there is nowhere to run to unless we really create our own. And this is what back to my introduction where I really am. My next step is not dealing with their diversity programs and telling them how not to be racist and telling them that they're part of the problem. I've been doing that for the longest part of my life. I'm kind of like so over that. Um, this is now about not you, you know, spending money on doing your diversity courses and this and that, but giving us the resources. So this is my my form of reparation in a sense to say you want to do something against racism, then the pro profit the person who profits from that has to be the person who um, who who is um, affected by racism, right? And not you know mm -hmm. make white people feel better that you're less racist than you were yesterday. But you know, give us the resources, give us the facilities, give us the reparations. You know, um, right here, we don't even have to go that far to look to where you know to where to pay um, for what you need to make better because it's, it's right here. And we need a new system. We need a new system on all levels to be the system, it be it digital or be it the walls, the museums, the schools, the institutions. We just need our own. Otherwise, we're not going to get out of this at all in any way. You can't build an Afrofuture or Afrofutures with an S, right? A series of Afro. Um, or altered worlds or utopias if you are still within the same oppressive structural That's system exactly. and in the same algorithms that res end up with the same results, right? So you mm -hmm. have to decolonize the tech, you have to decolonize um, the, the, the mindscapes of the people who are you know, executing the technology, you have to decolonize every space that we occupy. And we have to renegotiate the national and international conversations we have around resources and around whose lives matter, right? We are actually living in a world which is the economists have already agreed that the only way they can move forward is if Africa as a continent does not have the power to manufacture its own resources for itself, right? That is an understood part of um, economics, global economics. I don't know if they put it in the books. I don't know if they write it so overtly. I don't think they do. There are a few books that I have on my shelf that have actually had that conversation. Most of them skip right over that, right? Um, and they go into these old conversations about, you know, why there is not as much development. On, in the continent of Africa. Well, it's not a question of talent or personal responsibility or instability or, you know, or, you know, them just not being organized or group leaders or bad leaders. It is a conscious choice that has been made by Western, European, American, you know, corporations with the world's um, institutions um, support, right, to do so. And I think if we are, if we can't even we can't even change the paradigm in that regard in terms of the actual natural resources on the planet and having a more egalitarian approach to that, right? We're, that's that's going to change. That's not going to change any of the dynamics of people having to leave their homes to go somewhere else to try to make a living because they are. it's been impossible for them to do so where all of the resources are, by the way, right? They want to go where they're being, where people are enjoying those resources and where you they're developed, right? So that affects our our uh, immigration policies and everything else, right? All of these uh, all of these things are connected. And it goes all the way back to what Florence, what each of you have all been saying, um, in terms of where we find the moment that we find ourselves now, which is very similar to the moments that we found ourselves before. Right? <laughs> um, there's a strange echo in the room, right? Um, uh, uh, would like um, Naomi to speak, but I also would like Elle to talk a little bit about your your um, philosophy that you have um, about the art, um, because I feel like we're in, in in terms of Afrofuturism and talking about like the things that we have to address to build these Afro futures or to to imagine them first, right? You have to imagine them before you can create it. Um, we're in a uh, reemergence of Afrofuturist thought and a, a um, in a, a global expansion of it, right? Um, but um, Littlefield has a particular take on ideals of renaissance. <laughs> so uh, I want to kind of uh, 
I want to respond to the conversation about restitution and kind of leading into uh, what what I, I want to bring up for a second. So I'm always thinking about in terms of trying to uh, foretell the future and kind of know where we need to be and what we need to be doing. I'm always looking at patterns. To me, that is the best way to predict anything. And a lot of times with patterns, you know, you need a, a large swath of time to really see what the emerging pattern is over time. When I think about restitution, um, and I definitely don't want to be a pessimist, I think I tend to err on the side of what are we going to do if we never get these things back? Right. I think a lot about the things that have been stolen from black people that are not tangible objects. Right. That we could never get back. Say, for instance, culture, music, uh, artistic practice. Right. These are things we can't. Time. Right? <laughs> um, however, we are time. Right. <laughs> Which we were told this last year to re reclaim our time. But what I think about. And I began to think about this when I was younger, when I would think about music in particular, Black American music and how we see kind of uh, the industry bring in white Americans usually to imitate that music so that very quickly it's kind of not ours anymore. Um, the thing that is always great about that is that by the time another group has kind of successfully learned to mock what black people are doing, whether it's our language, our music, our style of dress or our intellectual thought, because I can see now there is a lot of kind of mocking of black intellectual thought where everyone else is kind of following that wave. Right. That is that by the time everybody else does it, we're on to something new. Black people are constantly creating the black imagination is uh, kind of an uh, a <laughs> it's an outer space right there there is there is no end to it it is infinite so by the time other people can catch on and get the footwork the way we got it we made up a new dance already <laughs> okay. so there is this way in which we can't get these tangible objects back what are we going to do if we never get these tangible objects back the way the world is moving what time what the pattern of time tells me is that we will come up with something else that's not to say we shouldn't do that work of trying to reclaim what has been stolen from us but we know as black women right we got to hope for the best and plan for the worst we still have to kind of be ready for what if we don't get those things back what are we doing already to ensure that we have that we have culture that serves us even if we can never get these objects back. Uh, so in thinking about patterns, one of the things that I have to start with, with Cherie, I hope, right, not to embarrass you, but I have to, I have to start with you in terms of thinking about how I came to this idea of the kind of patterns I see in Black Renaissance and revolution, particularly as it relates to Black thought and Black artistic creation and Black literature and music. There is an absolute pattern to this. We've had two major movements in the past, right? So if we can think about like the Harlem Renaissance, and then roughly 50 years later, we get the Black arts movement, which coincides with the civil rights movement and the Black power movement. I started to study those things when I was in college, primarily because I got a copy of Dark Matter, which came out in 2000, which was the year I graduated high school. One of the things I noticed like instantly that year is that I graduated the year before in high school. I can count the number of people I knew with a cell phone. And by the end of my freshman year, I came home to Memphis and there was not a person I knew who didn't have a cell phone. Right. That technology, they disseminated it that quickly. Right. So I knew something new was going to happen. I read Dark Matter that year and I think it almost kind of propelled me to see myself. 20 years from then, right? I was not a privileged youth. Uh, I was not someone kind of in college who had all the means to, to achieve the vision I saw for myself. So I had to kind of time travel and say, okay, this is where I want to be in 20 years. I'm so far behind. How do I kind of hit this target that is moving uh, that is moving forward, that's changing position and also accelerating, right? How am I going to hit this target? 
when I began to see, okay, there are these patterns around the prior movements we've had, not only what happened within those movements, but all the conditions surrounding those movements, right? And what I began to notice is that both these major movements uh, came after a great time of migration for Black people, and also after some catastrophic event and some particular event that kind of changed the socio-political landscape, mm -hmm. right? So we know before the Harlem Renaissance, what happens obviously is emancipation. What happens at the time of the Black Arts Movement is the Civil Rights and Black Power Movement is happening. And then, right, Black people kind of get a little more mobility in terms of their ability, at least to move around in the States, in America, perhaps not all over the globe. Mm. So I said, OK, if this happened 50 years apart here and then I could even look back before that and say there's a slight movement that happens even before the Harlem Renaissance. There's a movement in nonfiction in black nonfiction, which mm -hmm. is slave narratives and essays, the Harlem Renaissance. And then there appears to be a lull, but there's also a sort of movement in between there. When we get the black arts movement, and after that, there's also kind of other movements. I, I, I think I've spoken probably to Sheree a lot about urban literary fiction and kind of how black women's urban literary fiction hits the scene. So I knew when I read Dark Matter that the next movement was Afrofuturism there was no possibility that it could really be anything else, right? We had had the reflection of the past. We had had a moment uh, or a movement that was centered around uh, correcting our present state, right? And so the next movement had to look to the future and nothing made that clearer to me than when I read, I think both issues of Black Matter, uh, Dark Matter while I was in undergrad. Right. And so for me, I'm always kind of looking to those patterns and kind of seeing, trying to understand what what's going to be next. How do I how do we get ready for for what's next? How have we already prepared for what's next? Thank you. Thank you so much. You have all been so wonderful to talk with um, just to kind of reflect on this time period and all the different places that we've had to go, that we were always going um, in our effort to make lives better for ourselves and for the people we love, um, for our communities. I find that the intellectual labor, the heavy lifting that black women do wherever they find themselves lifts everyone. It always has. Um, um, and we should be supported in the work that we do. Um, in my Afro future, that I imagine black women are supported, black women and girls, um, those who identify as women are supported in the work that they do because it's vital and critical. Um, this has been where there is a woman, where there is one, two, three, four, <laughs> five women, there is deep, deep magic um, with many thanks to Intazaki Shonge for the beautiful poem um, that she, um, she wrote so long ago, perhaps imagining um, this moment and the moments behind us. When there is a woman, there is magic. If there is a moon falling from her mouth, she is a woman who knows her magic, who can share or not share her powers. A woman with a moon falling from her mouth, roses between her legs and tiaras of Spanish moss. This woman is a consort of the spirits. I have to say my spirit has been lifted listening to each of you today, um, deeply cur more curious about the new work that you'll be doing, this new moment that we are in. Um, Cause I think about the Harlem Renaissance and there was the Spanish flu at that time, right? And all of the massacres, the riots that took place um, as well. And then the Renaissance, right? So it's like, we're, we're constantly creating work, art, um, to save ourselves, right? To save, to communicate, to express our, 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 our witnessing and to save ourselves. Um, it is an artifact of the past, it is a testament to the present and it is a hope for the future. I thank each of you. I thank the New York Live Arts team for this wonderful symposium today, Dr. Renato Anderson. Thank you all so much, Dr. Natasha Kelly from Berlin. D.L. Littlefield from Memphis, Tennessee and Mississippi. <laughs> Nyama, Sophia, Sandy in Pittsburgh now. <laughs> and Florence Okoye in Warwick, England. Thank you all so very much. <laughs>